Welcome to the Spiritual Forum, everyone. So glad you're here. I will introduce my guests in just a minute. I just want to thank everyone for listening and to remind you that this podcast is all about inspiring people to be on the spiritual journey. And we have people from all different walks of life, all different experiences, all different stories. And I'm really excited about the story today. I also invite you to tell your friends and family about this podcast if you enjoy it and sign up for a newsletter on thespiritualform.org. And what else? Um, I think that's it. You can rate and review it too. That would be helpful. But really just glad you're here and part of the Spiritual Forum community. All right, now I'm going to introduce my guest. Having studied Yang-style Tai Chi intensively during his years in the Boston area under Grandmaster Jin Soon Chu and his son, Master Vincent Chu, Levi Benchmul moved to Israel in 1991. During his 10 years there, Levi began teaching Tai Chi, met his Kabbalah teacher, and co-created Sulam Chi. Sulam Chi means ladder of force energy, and it is a graceful and powerful set of movements that integrates the energies of Tai Chi and Kabbalah's mystical tree of life. He returned to the United States in 2001 and is currently a teacher of Tai Chi, Kabbalah, and Ayurveda. Levi recently authored the book, Actually, I don't think it's recent. I think it's come out recently. Oh, we'll talk about that in a minute. He authored the book, Living Wisely. And Living Wisely is a collection of wisdom topics which guide the reader in exploration and self-inquiry. Welcome, Levy. Thanks so much, Carl. It's great to be here. Yeah, am I right about your book? It came out like in 2014, but there's a new- It was published in 2014. And I'll just tell everybody up front, I'm almost done with the second edition, which will be coming out later this year. Okay, great. Okay, so I had the the, the 2014 edition. Is that yes. correct? Okay, yes. great. I really enjoyed your book. Um, so I um, I think I think a great place for us to start is just you tell us in your words about your spiritual journey. Um, I kind of gave a synopsis there, but you know, how did you get to where you are, and what was your journey with God and your spiritual life, and and becoming a teacher? Okay, happy to give you a quick synopsis. Uh, it, it started for me when I was between 8 and 10. I don't remember the exact age. I grew up on Long Island in a conservative Jewish home, attended public school, and a few afternoons a week I would go to Hebrew school. And one day I was walking down the hall behind the principal of the Hebrew school, and Carol, all of a sudden everything opened up, and I was in a presence and energy that as an eight or 10 year old, I didn't quite know what it was, but it seemed like God to me. It was so powerful, so big. And from that time on, I knew I was going to explore what that was and experience it again. It turns out I didn't do that. I didn't begin to do that until my late twenties when I was living in the Boston area and established in what was my profession at the time. I started out professionally as a software developer. And uh, I was living in Brookline, Massachusetts, and I just flipped open the local adult ed catalog, and there was an advertisement for a 10-week course on Tai Chi. At the time, I had no idea what Tai Chi was, absolutely no idea, but I don't know if you've had the experience that sometimes you just know you have to do something, you're not quite sure why, yeah, and you so trust that. Divide and guidance is something in you, yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> I went. It turns out the teacher was the son of Grandmaster Jin Sun Chu. I enjoyed the course, and at the end of the course, he invited us to visit his father's school in Chinatown on the edge of Boston. So a few of us went, and I will never forget my first experience of meeting Grandmaster Chu. We called him Sifu. That is a Chinese term that pretty much means teacher. So Sifu was working with one of his advanced students, a, a pretty large Westerner white guy. Sifu was a pretty short Chinese man. And they were standing opposite each other with their hands raised and palms crossed and the back of their hands lightly touching. And they were doing very subtle movements. I had no idea what they were doing, but suddenly Sifu flicked his wrist, and this very large man flew across the room and hit the opposite wall. 
Oh my gosh. That was exactly my reaction. I didn't know what happened, but I knew I was going to find out what that was. I was going to learn about it for myself. That was an example in a martial arts sense, because I went to a martial arts school for Tai Chi, of using Chi, the life force energy, in a very dramatic way. The exercise was called push hands. So from that experience, I said, I'm in. I became a dedicated student of Tai Chi. And not just learning Tai Chi, I also fell in love with the philosophy behind it, which is Taoism. And the Tao is, the idea of the Tao is very similar to our Western idea of God. It's not exactly the same, but that became my spiritual path at the time. Okay. And devoted myself to it. Gained a lot of skill in all kinds of ways, but I knew it wasn't enough. Something was missing for me. And the something that was missing was I felt my heart was still closed. Okay. And I didn't feel that I had found that connection, that experience again of what I had when I was eight or 10 at my Hebrew school. So to make a long story short, I moved to Israel. I was living in Jerusalem. I began teaching Tai Chi in Jerusalem in 1993. And I had met a metaphysical teacher who I was doing some very good work with and was having some very interesting experiences. But after a few years, I got frustrated because, again, it wasn't that connection that I was really looking for with God. I shared my frustration with a friend and he said, Levy, you have to meet this woman from the United Kingdom. So a native English speaker. She has a unique connection to God. And I'm sure she can help you find what you're looking for. So I set up a meeting with her. Her name was Hadassah Ben Yishai. And I got more than I bargained for when I met Hadassah and then began studying under her. Wow. So let's just pause for a minute because that packed a lot. (laughs) Um, First, I just want to I want to note that this experience you had when you were like eight years old or eight to ten, whatever, whatever age you were, um, I'm finding there's kind of a, I'm finding a similar story with some people um, who are on the spiritual path where they had this really profound spiritual experience at a young age. And then, and then it, and they kind of went on to live their lives. You said you wanted to be a software developer in your twenties or, you know, Mm -hmm. so there's something, there's something about having this experience and then kind of losing track and, and finding yourself immersed in what, you know, the, that this world tells us to do, you know, I was mm-hmm. an engineer, <laughs> I worked for an oil company for 20 years. Um, and, and then, but there's still this yearning in your heart, you know, like there's something like, you know, you, you didn't act, maybe you couldn't have acted on when you were eight, but it's still there, it's still there. And, and you allowed it to lead you to the next place, which was the Tai Chi place. And I think right. that's just fascinating. Um, yeah, I, along with that, I don't know if it was similar for you, But there was a dissatisfaction. I mean, for a lot of reasons, there was a dissatisfaction for the life circumstances I grew up in, what I saw around me. And I knew I wasn't going to stay in the box of what was a conventional life. And I knew that from early on, but didn't actually do anything about it till my late 20s. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's actually early for a lot of, I mean, if you did something about it in your early twenties, that's actually early for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think that, I think that for most of us, when we really look at what, what culturally is accepted for us, you know, the kinds of careers we should have and whatnot, it's, it's, it's not satisfying. It's, it's, it's not, it's not what our heart is yearning for. Our heart's yearning for seeking God and, and experiencing love and opening up the heart and, and living fully like that. And when you look around at, you know, uh, the job fairs at college or whatever, (laughs) none of it's about that, you know, it's about getting the job and having the career and getting the money and being, being safe and secure. I'll tell you one thing that was interesting for me, I was very fortunate in that I always enjoyed my work. Oh, that's great. I, I, I was pretty good at it. And just as I shared with our son when he was growing up, enjoy the relationships, enjoy the people around you. And again, I was just really lucky that at work, I connected with great people and always enjoyed it. But at the same time, like you said, that yearning was there, 
that deeper dissatisfaction was there. And I knew I couldn't just live my life out as a software engineer. Yeah, I, I think that's wonderful advice to make connections with the people that you work with. I, I look back on my career, which was, to me, it was like, you know, in a way it was, it was aligned with my left brain part and I love logic and solving problems. But in, in the rest of me, it was so far away from who I was, but I love the people I worked with. And I, I found it just enjoyable going to work every day because I really like the people. And I think we never really know how we're impacting people in the world, whether we're you know, on the, the right track or off track or what, we can still impact everybody that we're around and, and make connections. Definitely. Um, yeah. So the, the, um, you, you, you said Taoism became your spiritual path. Can you yes. share with me, before we get into all the rest of the stuff in Israel, which I know is going to be really interesting, but then where did, how did Judaism fit in for you at that time? Or how does it fit in for you now? Yeah, uh, back, back then, this was, um, I started studying Tai Chi in 1985, and I had already lived in Israel for over a year. I had done a program a few years after college that gave me the opportunity to uh, live and work in Israel. So I had established a very strong connection with the land of Israel, the Israeli people, and a spiritual connection through being there. So I wasn't practicing any of the Jewish traditions, but that connection was already deep within me. Uh, so, as I said, I became fascinated with Taoism, and uh, it's very it's a very nature based path. And I've always been a nature lover, and being in nature has always been a great way for me to connect. So it was very appealing on all kinds of levels. But I was a bit conflicted, Carol, between these two very divergent ways, yeah. East and West. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with a rabbi, rabbi named Zalman Shachter Shalomi. He yeah. passed away a few years ago. He uh, was one of the leaders of let's call it New Age Judaism, for lack of a better term, a man rooted in an orthodox tradition from when he grew up in Europe, but fled Europe during World War II and, and grew up the rest of his life in the States and was an amazing teacher. He was uh, in the book, The Jew and the Lotus, which is an interesting story for another time. Okay. But anyway, I, he was giving me a lecture at Brandeis University, and not far from where I lived. And I decided to go to the lecture to ask him my burning question after the lecture was over. I feel conflicted between my Jewish heritage and studying Tai Chi and Taoism. What's your advice? So he said to me, put on your talit, wrap yourself in your tefillin, and do Tai Chi. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. So the talit is the Jewish prayer shawl. Tefillin are known as phylacteries in English. They're leather bands you wrap around yourself as part of morning prayer. And so his beautiful message was, don't forget what your core is. And as long as you don't forget, welcome in Taoism Tai Chi. And I felt anything else that could help you grow and move forward and connect deeper to the divine. Wow, that's wonderful wisdom. I think um, people think that there's like an either or with these different traditions. And what I think that's so interesting is he wanted to emphasize that your core mattered, you know, like, you know, hey, you know, stay focused, you know, know, know you came from here, but venture out and, and do what where God is leading you. And um, is that we don't need to be limited. You know, we don't need to be limited ever by any kind of box, even even like a religious box. Exactly. And for, for me, like I said, I already had established a deep connection, in particular, because I lived in Israel, and it, it was there from a time when I was a child, too. Uh, but I think there is a, a real wisdom in that look, for some people, maybe they have to reject their their heritage that for whatever reason, mm -hmm. but that wasn't the case for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so before we get into your, your 10 years in Israel, can you explain to me and anybody who's listening the difference between Tai Chi and Qigong? Sure. Yeah. Um, 
Tai Chi is a, a very uh, elaborate form of Qigong. Qigong is a generic term for energy exercises. And Tai Chi is, again, a very specific world into itself energy exercise. So it would fall, I mean, of course, no one really calls Tai Chi Qigong, but in essence, that is what it is. Okay. And so, and how would you describe it? Because I, I know that there, the body movements, and I, I, I've, I do Qigong, but I'm, <laughs> I'm obviously not a master because I, I've, I've learned certain body movements. And I had a, a guest on a few weeks ago who teaches a Qigong method called the whole body prayer. And my, my experience of it is it is an activity that really, to me, my experience is I, I get very grounded. Like mm -hmm. my, my, I can feel my energy moving from my head into my body. I mm -hmm. feel like my, my awareness is like my whole body versus my head. Uh -huh. or, or my heart, but that that's that's the in effect it has on me. And it's 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 moving the energy in your body. Is that correct? It, absolutely correct. And Tai Chi is it's a full mind body spirit practice. Uh -huh. And there are so many aspects to it. But let me just try to summarize a few of the main points. Uh, the idea of connecting heaven and earth is very big in Taoism and all these practices. So what you said, feeling a really clear, strong connection to the earth. And it's, yes. it's a literal connection and feeling. At the same time, as you do the movements, relaxing your body to the greatest extent that you can to allow the energy to flow as freely as possible. And at the same time, receiving this, let's just call it heavenly energy and again, in Taoism, it's not a, a God sense, but this cosmic force mm -hmm. that animates all of life, allowing it in, allowing it to flow through all the meridians, all the energy channels of the body as cleanly and openly as possible, while being fully aware of what's going on inside of you and being fully aware of what's going on outside of you. So it's a very awake practice. Some people call it meditation in motion, mm -hmm. which I agree, but a meditative state where you're fully aware of everything on the inside and the outside. Yeah, I, I think that Western traditions are missing that body energy component. Um, whether you do prayer or meditation, there's something about the movement of the body that's, I think, very important to spiritual practice that's missing in, in a lot of Western traditions. What do you think? Agreed, and not to jump ahead of the story, but it's it's the reason that I co-created Sulam Chi, okay. which we'll talk about in, in a little while. Uh, okay. Yeah. Look, in general, in general, a lot of people talk about this that we are so stuck in our heads in the West and yes. have created the world that we have in a big way because we're not connected to our bodies and connected to nature. Absolutely. Yes. We've got a head centered world. All we have to do is look out and see it. And we're going, we're going into that more with, you know, um, AI and, and all that we're getting, you know, more there, at least there's one timeline that's going that direction. So yeah, I don't know if you saw the movie Wally. -E. Yes, yes. It's my middle daughter's favorite movie. She's like <laughs> 33 years old or 32 years old. but We watch it all the time. But that's the ultimate expression yes. of that, right? Exactly, exactly. And that's where we could be taking ourselves unless we come back to, I think, some of these practices and reconnecting with the earth. Yeah, and I think there's a real good shot that we will. I think more and more people are yearning for that. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, yeah. I'm because it's, it's, it's like <laughs> there, it's very empty and, you know, two dimensional. But um, I just want to say before we go forward, when you said, when you said that uh, Taoism, it's not God so much as the cosmic energy that animates all life. That's my definition of God. <laughs> my, my definition of God is the cosmic energy that animates all life. But I understand that's also not the traditional, you know, anthropomorphic God that. Yeah, well, you know. I mean, we'll get into it in a little bit. Okay. Uh, Taoism, it doesn't talk about a personal relationship. Right. In right. the same way as Rumi does. Right. Or as 
my teacher taught me. Right. And that's that's a big differentiation, I think. Right. And I think, you know, I think we could, you can do both. So we'll. Absolutely. We'll let... I mean, there's, again, there's no conflict as right. we talked earlier. Exactly. You, you know, can put them all together. Yeah. You can have a personal conversation and then, you know, have the ultimate cosmic energy. And, you know, nothing can really limit God or source or mystery or whatever words people want to use. I know you're you're sensitive to the fact that the word God has been kind of abused in some ways. And so sometimes yeah. you have to let people translate however they want. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so let's get into your time in Israel and your mystical teacher there and the development of uh, Sulam Chi. Okay, so yeah, to pick up the story then, to, as, as I left off earlier, so I my friend recommended meeting this this mystical teacher Hadassah Ben Yishai. So I got her number, called her up, set up a meeting, and uh, I'll tell you a funny little story. I I drove over to the neighborhood in Jerusalem where she lived, which was not a neighborhood I went to very much, so wasn't that familiar with it. Anyway, as I drove down the main street to get to her apartment building, I looked up. And above me was this massive green road sign with, in huge letters, Hadassah written with an arrow pointing to her building. I'm, okay. I'm telling you the truth. <laughs> <laughs> and I just said to myself, this is crazy that if I needed a sign, here it was. Yeah, asking God for a sign. There it is. <laughs> yeah, literally a sign. Anyway. Hadassah Hospital was like a mile up the road. Okay. So that's what the sign was pointing to for most people. But for me, it was uh, your teacher. a real fun sign. <laughs> I'm about to meet somebody special. So uh, in that first meeting, we just sat and talked. Uh, turns out she was a woman around my age, lovely person. And she started to talk about her relationship to God and what she called the divine romance. And as she spoke about it, this intimate relationship that she lived with the divine, her eyes lit up, the energy in the room changed. And Carol, I knew this is what I'm looking for. This is what was missing from all my studies and work in Tai Chi. And I also learned other traditions. I got into yoga. I was macrobiotic for a while. I did cleanses. I did all, all kinds of things in those years when I was studying Tai Chi. But this was it. This was, let's just say, the path of the heart to God that I was looking for. And I was so excited to have met her and then said, yes, I'm going to be your student and begin that part of my journey. Wow. So it sounds a little roomy-like. Very roomy. -like. Yeah, you know, like when you read <laughs> Ruby's poetry, it's like, oh my gosh, these are love songs. It's so beautiful, and it's so inspiring. It's, it's also it reminds me a little bit of that scene in Harry Met Sally, where it's like, you know, I want some of that. You know, it's like <laughs> there's some ecstasy that's going on with a person who is so intimately, uh, you know, like the like you, like Ru Rumi poetry. I mean, you have to tell me more about her, but Rumi poetry just makes me realize that there's something more for us to experience with God if we're not having that same kind of experience. Oh yeah, it was it was so rich. It was it was exactly that. I said I have to have some of this. Yeah. Just no question. And I couldn't wait to get started. Okay. Wow. And and how old were you at that time? Okay, at that time that was 96. So I was 38. What? Okay, so you're in your 30s. You're in 30s. Okay, yeah. late 30s. All right. Yeah. All right. I, I, I'm asking because the, there's different things happen when you're at mid -age, middle age versus the, the 20s and 30s. So different things going on in your psyche. Okay, so you embarked yeah. on, on she became your teacher. She became my teacher and uh, she used Kabbalah's Tree of Life as one of her main tools to help people discover what was in the way of experiencing that divine romance, how to clear it, how to connect to the different energies of it and make that relationship, for me, the, turns out the foundation of my life, but certainly making it a very central part of your life. 
Uh, so the Tree of Life, which is very much a part of my book, Living Wisely, it's, it's kind of the underlying map of the book, is uh, a map of divine energy flowing through creation, including us. And so there are 10 energy centers called Sphirot in Hebrew. The singular is Sphira. They're all mapped to the body. And we can talk about them a little bit more as we get into the conversation. But I'd like to, if it's okay, share with you my first session with her. Yeah, sure. Yeah. To get a taste of, yeah. of really what, what got me excited. So set up that first session, went back, and we at first talked about my life a little bit because, you know, as many, as many teachers do, they use the template of your life as the jumping off point to move forward. I mean, how else can it be? So after sharing a bit, um, and it, it all, while all this is going on, she's tuning in to higher realms, different realms, and receiving information, guiding her about what I needed in that session, in that moment. And she was guided to share with me this verse from the Old Testament is very important for you. It's from the book of Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 10, which translates to rejoicing in the Lord is my strength. Mm. I said, okay, <laughs> you know, great verse, sounds good. So she said, <laughs> let's, let's meditate on that verse. And I had been meditating for years at that point. So I was very comfortable with getting into a meditative state. So we did, closed our eyes and I started meditating on that verse and all of a sudden, I noticed Carol. Now, again, I was a very, I was person very tuned into to my body after, you know, being a student of Tai Chi and other practices, as a lifelong athlete. I noticed something was going on, a physical sensation around my heart, mm. and that was, I wasn't afraid. It was like, okay, something's going on here that's different. And as we continued the meditation, it felt like there was a tapping on my chest, on my heart. Wow. So I said, okay, finish the meditation. And then Hadassah asked me, well, how was it? So I shared what I just shared with you. And all of a sudden, there's a big smile on her face. And she said, Lady, that was God talking to you. Oh, you know, what's home for you? being in your body. And it was such an amazing experience to think, Carol, that God cared about me so much that he, she, however you want to call the divine, paid attention to me to that degree that the divine was tapping on my heart to help, help me know. Wow. In the right place, lady. And we're going to open this baby up. Right, because I said you you went there to, because you wanted to open your heart, and the first thing that happens is is a knocking on your heart. That's fabulous. So then, what happened? I was hooked. I was hooked. Yeah. I said, I can't wait for the next session, and that's how it was for years. Every session was an adventure in spirit, an experience, and using, as I mentioned earlier, many times the template of Kabbalah's Tree of Life to help me unlock what was in the way of experience that divine romance more and more. Okay. All right. Do you want to go into the Kabbalah now? Sure. Okay. Sure. You have a specific question you want to start with? Well, you, uh, can you, you, can you, can you talk about the different aspects in the tree of life? Sure. Of course. So Kabbalah, uh, means it comes from the verb to receive. So for me, uh, the, the great gift of Kabbalah is to receive the divine energy and have it be a part of our everyday lives. You know, you referred to God as earlier, Carol, as cosmic energy, like the Tao, and, and I agree. It's, it's all energy is energy. The source is the source. But again, this notion of that you can have a personal relationship with that energy and literally bring it into your life in a day-to-day -day way was really appealing to me. So the way the tree of life is structured, there are three columns to it, left column, center column, and right column. The left column is associated with 
uh, the female, the internal. Okay. The right column is associated with the masculine and the expansive. And the middle column is a place where these complementary opposite energies can find balance and harmony. Okay. So as I mentioned earlier, there are 10 uh, energy centers called spherot. There's an additional hidden one. And each one is a different emanation of divine energy uh, with different characteristics. There are names of God in Hebrew associated with which one. There are colors, there are sounds. But uh, for, for me, the, the main focus was on the different qualities of the divine that are embodied in us and that we can live in a sacred way. So that's a, a quick overview of the Tree of Life. Oh, that's great. That's great. So you, how did you, okay, so I, first I want to kind of inter, ask how you integrated that with Taoism, and then let's talk about how you co-created Sulam Chi. Okay, well, at that point, after that experience that I had with Rabbi Zalman Shachter Shalomi, there was, there was no conflict anymore between delving deeply into my own heritage as well as Taoism or Hinduism or anything else, because my core, my core was my core, and I had no fears about losing myself following any of these paths. So at that point, when I was working with Hadassah, I had been practicing Tai Chi for over a decade at that point. It's just what I did. So there was just no conflict at all. Uh, Sulam Chi, though, is it's just it's a beautiful integration of these energies. You, know, you asked me earlier about that. And the, the quick story behind Sulam Chi, uh, another student of Hadassah's came to me because he had the inspiration of creating a Jewish movement form. We oh. spoke earlier about how in the West there really aren't right. a lot of movement forms to express the divine or our connection to God. And so me being a Tai Chi teacher, he said, can you help me figure out the movements that correspond to the sphere of the energy centers. I said, I'd love to. It, it didn't take me much time at all, probably because I had practiced Tai Chi for so long, the movements were very much a part of me, to just intuit what Tai Chi-like movements would be expressions of this divine energy. So that's how Sulam Chi was, was born back in Jerusalem in 1999, there are a set of prayers or intentions that go along with each of the movements. And it is a seamless integration of these energies of the Tao and, and Kabbalah. Uh, I've taught it to people from all over the world, all ages, all traditions. And it, it truly is a universal prayer and motion for, for anyone. Wow, that is so cool. And so you're teaching that now? Yeah, I'm teaching it now. I also uh, recently put up an online course on my website where people can learn it on demand whenever they like. Okay, so they don't have to come to you in California. You can. Oh, no, no, you can, yeah. you can learn it anywhere. Okay, so is it something that is, is it, is it a, um, a set of movements that you learn or is it something that there's some sort of a, uh, levels that you go through to get to certain levels? Is it something? Yeah, it's that... very much like a uh, Tai Chi or a Qigong form. It's a, a standard set of movements. Okay. There are seven of them. The first three energy centers of the Tree of Life are associated with the mental level. Okay. So there are no movements for those top three sphere out. But then when you go lower on the tree, and again, it's all mapped to the body, there are seven movements done in a specific order. So it, it very much is like a Tai Chi form. I think a lot of people have seen uh, videos of older people in parks in China yes. <laughs> doing these slow motion right. movements. So again, it's a very set pattern. You can repeat them as often as you like in the sequence. It only takes a few minutes to do it. But just like any other practice, the more you do it, you uncover layers and layers of meaning. Okay. So you can go deeper and deeper into it. Okay. I just have this vision of like children learning this, like, you know, like 
when, when there's a lot of turmoil out there or we're really upset about the world that we all just kind of pause and, and do our body movement and get recentered and remember who we are. That's a great vision. Yeah. Because I think you think so much of the angst of what's going on in the world is we're just lost. We've completely forgotten our divine nature and the energy that we are and the potential that we are and the 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 divine within us. And we're so uh, we're stuck at some really low vibration with anxiety and angst about other people and other groups and dividing ourselves and stuff. It's like it's such a waste of time. Yeah, it's, it's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking if you know it can be different. And we know it can be different. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it's one of my prayers. It's yeah. absolutely one of my prayers that more and more people, I think of it as remembering. Nothing nothing went anywhere. It's right here, right, right. now. And just a matter of, oh, yeah, it's like, I forgot. <laughs> right. We're constantly forgetting that the outer world is constantly pulling us and thinking that we're identified with that or that or that. And it, I think the spiritual path is a constant remembering, constant coming back home. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah and look, I mean, as one of the chapters in my book, you, you're worshiping something. That's I read the that one today. Who we are. <laughs> you are worshiping something, whether yeah. it be music or a food or whatever but the deepest most satisfactory form of worship in my experience is is worshiping the divine yeah i it's so interesting what i love about your book is um you know it's not a book that you look at and go oh gosh i've got to set aside a lot of time for this or i've i've got a, this is a vacation book this is a book that you can pick up any time during the day and just open it up. I think, I mean, is, is it okay if you just open it up to what, what you open it up to and read that? Or do you think you need to go That's, in a certain order? You, that is exactly one of the ways you can make use of my book to exactly right. Just pick it up, open it up. And a lot of people have reported that whatever they open up to speaks to them in that moment. Yeah, and, and helps them in that moment. You could also read it cover to cover if, sure. if you like, for sure. Yeah. Do you have your book with you? Of course. Will Here you read? Is. Will you read chat, uh, page seventy-two? That's the one sure. about worship. I think it'd be good to give people an idea about what's in your book. Um, you know, I don't know that this is the right word, but it, it's almost like a daily devotional to me, um, where you can kind of open up and read that page and it's uh, pieces of wisdom and you're left with an inquiry or a question and that can be like your meditation for the day you know as you go out <laughs> absolutely into the absolutely. world yeah, Are you yeah gonna... I really I, I think of it as as a guidebook for living and again these what I call the wisdom statements that start each chapter are they're based on my experience, but an experience that's rooted in thousands of years of tradition, just reinterpreted for us to make it easy to digest. And and I wrote the book in such a way that the chapters are really short, typically just a page. So, <laughs> you know, knowing how stressed and <laughs> levels of concentration. Uh, so, yeah, it's it's a great way to read it, to just pick it up. And I'm happy to read chapter 72. Yeah, that'd be great, because I think that's what you were referring to, the worship. Uh, I was actually referring to... Let's okay, see. maybe not. Well, I'm happy to read whatever you want me to. Whatever, uh, whatever moves you, that's fine. Yeah, let's, let's, go with, let's, go with, let's go with this. This is good. Okay. So be, be clear on what you worship. That's the wisdom statement at the top of the page. Part of our nature is to worship. Whether you are aware of it or not, you have elevated something or someone in your life to a level where it receives special devotion and adoration. Your object of worship can take many forms. Some popular ones are money, sex, self-medication, and food. Just that anything that has control over you has the potential to come in a real sense your deity. Anything you worship can take you away from deepening your connection to your own essence and the source of life. 
it can lead you further away from fulfilling your potential. Wrong worship has the power to distort your relationship to life itself. We need to muster our will, courage, and strength to reject what's not worthy of our worship. We must be willing to see it clearly and let it go. In our willingness to be real regarding what we worship, we open the door for greater freedom and devotion. And then at the, the end of the, this chapter, some suggestions for going deeper. What are you worshiping is the first question. And the second, how is it limiting or expanding your life? Yes, yeah, so you can take that into your day. And it is interesting because I think most of us would think that we're not <laughs> we're not worshiping anything. <laughs> but it, all you have to do is look at what, what house you, you know, where where is exactly. your attention going to? What what are your constant thinking thinking about? Maybe we worship maybe we worship worry, you know, or anxiety. Yeah. Uh, yeah absolutely, yeah. And like you said, it's it's a question of uh, awareness on just really paying attention to where am I putting my energy, where am I putting my focus, and then reflecting on it, is it really good for me or not? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm curious about how this all came about. Uh, I I had this guess that every every chapter it has some story behind it for you, and I think it would have some story behind it for everyone. Um, did, this, did this book kind of just flow out of you, or was it something that you did over a long period of time? Yeah, uh, this is the second version of the book. Okay. The first version of the book was uh, my story interwoven with the teachings that I wanted to share. Uh, I finished it, I edited it, I was shopping it around, and I was told it's not going to be a success. You know, well-written, good story, but this is not what people were looking for at the time. And it was pretty devastating that I put a lot into that book and it never saw the light of day. About eight years later, I came back to writing the book and a lot had changed. I had, I mean, we all grow a lot in eight years, it changed in eight years, but I had been writing uh, for the Huffington Post at that point for a number of years. And it kind of fall in love with short form writing. Uh, again, easy to digest short pieces. And I knew I wanted to get back to writing the book to share these teachings. And the way this book manifested, it was a flash of insight. Another one of those moments where something came through and in a flash, I knew exactly what it was gonna look like, the format of the chapters, and I immediately started writing the book. And within hours, I had a bunch of these chapters done. Mm -hmm. And it continued to flow from there. Mm -hmm. It took over a year to complete it and edit it and publish it. But the genesis of it was just a flash of insight. Yeah, I think that's fascinating when you get kind of a download from the divine. It's like, I mean, it's not a download where it comes out in perfect order, but it's, it's, <laughs> It's interesting how God works in us, that sometimes if there's a struggle and it takes a while to write something or to express something. And other times it's like, like that, it's like insight. Yeah. And I think, I think what, what, the first way is not wrong. It doesn't mean like you're on the wrong path. It's just sometimes there's, a, there's more of a struggle like in a giving birth to something new. And other times it's just a really easy labor. Yeah. The However, I mean, there, there's no judgments for either one. It's, it, could, it could work that way and depending on all kinds of circumstances. So, yeah, this book went through a pretty long labor uh, for sure. But then yeah. when it was time, it was, it, was, it was all there. Yeah, right, right. And your first book, it, it, I mean, who knows? It may be something that at a different time or maybe it's, you know, you can publish it now. Uh, you know, I mean, who knows? I, I, it never occurred to me, but you're right. Uh, maybe I should take a look at that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because it's, it's divine. There's a divine time to everything too. You know, yeah. there's a divine order and there's a divine time. And sometimes we're ahead of of there of time. And I think there's a lot of people in the world. Um, someone like Tesla might have been like before his time. You know, there are people right. who come onto this planet with all these ideas, but there's no receptivity for it. And the ideas are planted, and they'll 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 take root 
in another time when people's consciousness are ready to to grow the idea. But they 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 serve humanity by being here. <laughs> ahead right, of time. right. That's, that's a very good point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering, do you want to talk a little bit about bringing heaven to earth? Uh, I think you mentioned that. Um, and what what does that mean to you? Okay. Well, I'm going to answer that question from a Kabbalistic perspective. Yeah. Which, which does have great meaning to me. Uh, in Kabbalah cosmology. There's the idea of what existed before creation. And in Hebrew, it's called Ein Sof, which means endless nothingness. Oh, okay. So according to Kabbalah theory, the, the divine had some kind of urge to create the universe, the world as we know it. And so the divine pulled back its energy to make space for creation out of this endless nothingness. And these vessels of light formed. Then the vessels shattered. And the shattered vessels are the world as we know it, the world of good and evil, the world of duality. And our job is to create tikkun olam. That means repair of the world. And we all have opportunities to take these shards of light and raise them back up to, to divinity. And when we do that, we're creating heaven on earth. And that can be done in any way you can think. Some examples, just smiling at a stranger as you walk by. That's raising up some light. You have no idea what that might mean to somebody. Taking care of your child, growing a plant, taking care of yourself. There are all ways to raise the light and to create heaven on earth. Yeah, I think so many of us are mistaken that we have to do something big, you know, like we have to be a great teacher or we have to be a great leader. And it's, it's these little things. I love what you say, like planting a seed, taking care of your child. These, these everyday things, you know, raise, raise up the light, raise our consciousness. So every, everyone's participating in this, this bringing heaven to earth. Absolutely. And look, a lot of people now talk about all hands on deck for the world that we have now. And I certainly believe it's the case. And we can all contribute, like you just said, in, in the smallest ways. And these are not insignificant. <laughs> One of the chapter titles in my book is being kind is being great. Ah, uh, yes, that's beautiful. And there's a Kabbalistic energy behind it. And again, when you're doing these things, you're bringing divinity, you're bringing sacredness into the world. It's not something far away. It's, it's right here. And we can all do this. Yeah, and you're talking about current times, all hands on deck. I love that. All hands on deck. <laughs> Everyone, <laughs> let's pick up the shards of light. All hands on deck. It does feel that way, doesn't it? It does feel like this, like we've, we've all got to be, we've all got to be in this business of bringing heaven to earth. Uh, or those of us that are aware enough that it's needed, we all have to be in activity. Yeah, and another way to look at it, I was just at uh, a conference this past weekend up in Northern California, the New Living Expo. I'm also a singer songwriter and I was invited to play, play my music at the conference. And one of the speakers said very clearly, there's a lot of people putting out negative energy. Mm -hmm. We see it all around us. For those of us called to the spiritual path, it's our job to bring in as much light as we can in all the ways that we can do it, both great and small. And a lot of people are putting out a lot of negative energy right now. Yeah, and, you know, turn on the news. <laughs> you, you get your dose of negative energy, turn on any, you know, anything on the TV is going to give you some negative energy. Yeah, and then but within our own lives, level of stress, especially after the last two years with yeah. COVID. Yeah. The level of stress and anxiety, it's, it's almost built into us now. So yeah. um, there's, there's something for everybody to do for sure. Right. Um, I'm, I'm, I'd, I'd like to talk to you just a little bit about um, 
Okay, so I'm a, I'm a unity minister, and there's, I think, sometimes a tendency to, for people to stay in the light and stay in the light, and um, I, I, sometimes I think there's an avoidance of the darker energies on the planet, and I, I've, I'm a proponent to, to, hold, to hold, the, hold the paradox, like you, you don't want to get sucked into the dark energies, but you have to know what's real out there in order to really bring light to it. If you avoid what's real, like you, you avoid any of the, the very, very, very challenging, horrible things going on in the world, you pretend they don't exist, then, then you're, you're, you're being light over here with the light. And it's really important for us to bring our light where the light isn't. Am I making myself clear? I, I absolutely agree. One of the things my Kabbalah teacher used to say is we're here to be fully human. And to be fully human means to acknowledge, yeah, I get angry. Yeah, I get judgmental. Yeah, I get all kinds of things that aren't the light. And not to reject any of it, because when we reject, we push down, we avoid, and we all know it doesn't go away. Right. None of it goes away. So, yes, I agree. We have to bring the darker aspects of who we are, starting with who we are. And that's, that's part of the transformational work, I believe, that we must look at our own darkness and have compassion on ourselves and do that inner work and bring it to the light raise those shards within us and yes not turn away from the world as it is face it as it is and as we were talking about a few minutes ago just do our part to the best of our ability to raise those sparks yeah that's beautiful i love that i love that story of the shards of glass <laughs> It's a great image. Yeah, it really yeah. is. And you know, I think at the end of the day, you can say, which shards of glass did I pick up? Or did I pick any up today? Or did I light? Did I shine my light somewhere? Or did I miss an opportunity to shine my light? Not to beat me up, beat myself up, but go, oh, you know, I could have I shown my light more today. So tomorrow's another day and I'll shine my light. Exactly. Just, I mean, the, yeah, I can't emphasize enough. And I'm sure you know this too, the, the, ability to forgive ourselves first for whatever failings we perceive is critical to give ourselves permission to be better yeah yeah and and it does it does feel like it does feel like we are really in strange times now so i love the all hands on deck <laughs> <laughs> all hands on deck um, what else would you like to share with us? What would you like to share uh, uh, about yourself or about your the the ministry that you are in the world? Sure. Uh, just just to emphasize, just one more aspect of of my book, Living Wisely. And again, this is from what I learned from my teacher. This idea that through doing everyday things, you can bring d divinity into the world in a very clear way, I think is really important for, for people to, to know that no matter where you are on your path, whether you're just starting out or advanced, whatever, there's always opportunities to, to live this, this divine romance, this love affair with God. And it's, it's such a wonderful energy, first for yourself and then to share with others, because it just lights people up and lights the world up. So uh, I'm very grateful I had the chance to write the book and, yeah. and, and share that with the world. And uh, for myself, uh, music over the years has become uh, a greater and greater form of worship for me. Turns out that uh, I didn't start music as as a singer songwriter until later in life and it was one of the things my teacher hadassah guided me to do in one session that we had back in in 2000 she got the message lady start writing love songs to god mm. and i had been playing guitar since i was a kid i always had a guitar with me but i really couldn't sing i never did anything with it always loved music and after she gave me that message, I sat down one morning and pretty much said, okay, God, if you want me to write a song, here I am. And to my amazement, a song came through. Wow. 
my first song called Film Me. So, and the music hasn't stopped since then. It's called what? Whenever I'm I sorry. Open myself, Say it again. Me? Your first song is called what? Film Me. Oh, Film Me. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. Fill me with your love, O oh Lord, with every breath I take. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. So I was blessed to produce a CD. I have one CD to date, which is available on all streaming services. It's called Take a New Road. So, uh, as I said, music has more and more been a very important way for me to connect. And music, as we know, has exploded with the availability of streaming services and the creativity of so many people has been unleashed through music. So I'm also hopeful that music is going to play a big part in helping us transform this world in a good way. Well, I mean, music does shift everything, you know, I mean, I've been in times, you know, I was in seminary and we would be sitting and learning and talking and stuff. And then, and then, you know, for a break, it, it, they put on the music <laughs> and Kurt just to start dancing, not any kind of form dance, but it completely shifts everything. Music is, it's like a, a language of the soul, you know, not exactly. the head. It, yeah. it cuts across everything. It doesn't yeah. matter. Even if you understand the words or not, it's a feeling, it's right. an experience. Right. And it's, it's interesting how you can hear a song from some earlier time of my life and I can remember how I was feeling then. Or what is that? What is that, yeah. that music? How does it make me feel? What was I thinking yeah. at the time? Where was I? And it's almost a, almost like it's a different way that we catalog our soul. So that's great yeah. that you're blessed in that way. I, I do want to talk a little more about the divine romance. I, I forgot to emphasize that some more. So that is, what would you tell people? How do we, so, uh, so people, so people are either kind of like, there is no God, <laughs> there, 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 the, there is no God. There are the, you know, if, if God was around, the, the world wouldn't be so messed up. And then there are the, um, the head believers in God, the ones who, you know, trust uh, the Bible or scripture or whatever their minister or rabbi or somebody tells them. And, and then, and then but this is something different though. you this divine yes. romance is something that is completely different. And how do yes. we, how do we go about getting some of that? How do we go about living that? Well, in my experience, the first step is you have to want it. Uh huh. And if you don't want it, it might, you might run across it and might smack you over the head and wake you up and say, wow, I didn't know that I wanted this. But for me, I wanted it. I, I yearned for it. I was searching for it. So I think for most of us, it starts with either that something's missing. Yeah. And I want to find out what that is. I'm not satisfied with my life. Or there's this yearning in, in your heart that you know love is missing in a way that you intuitively know your souls know your soul knows my life could be a lot different and then the way it works for at least for me and i know for you once you start searching then god starts answering yeah it might not be in the form you expected the answer might be quite a surprise right uh, right but i'm pretty confident you'll get an answer and if you stick with the question the yearning you'll be led to the experiences where you'll start experiencing that love. And Carol, a very important part of the divine romance is the experience of it is, you know, you are loved just the way you are. There's nothing you have to do. There's nothing wrong with you in the eyes of the divine. And when you have that experience of that unconditional love, it'll transform you. It'll just transform you. Yeah. And you'll want more of that. Yeah. And I, I do think it takes a, um, I like, I'd like that you brought up the yearning. It, it does take a, 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 some sort of initiative on our part, I think, to move towards the divine. Do you think that's true? Well, I think so. I mean, I just, you saying that remind me of the story of the Israelites in Egypt when they were in slavery mm -hmm. and they cried out, mm -hmm. they just cried out and that started the redemption story. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, yeah, it takes some kind of movement for yeah, sure. Yeah, I think we have to move forward in a way. Uh, I love that. I love that because the, without the cry, <laughs> there's no, there's no moving. The, the divine doesn't move towards us. Uh, that's beautiful. Yeah. So do you, do you just have daily conversations with God? Yes, I do. 
like you're talking to a person. Yep, I do. I love that. I just love that. I love that. So, because <laughs> that, that's how a person look can be. Exactly. So, you know, because I think people think that, you know, to pray, you have to have the right words or you have to memorize something or you, you know, you, you, you have to have something right, but it's, it's just like being with a friend. It's just like chatting with your best buddy. Exactly. And, and then when things, you know, it's always easy when things are going well, right. With any yeah. relationship, when disappointments come and you wanted it to be a certain way and it doesn't happen, you go back to the conversation, you express your disappointment. But another important aspect of this relationship is this, this underlying trust that is part of the foundation of being in the divine romance. So even when things are painful or it doesn't work out, it doesn't break the trust or that love. That's really important. Yeah, yeah. And we don't always know what's best for us. No, we don't. I certainly <laughs> didn't. <laughs> Haven't you gotten something better before than what you thought you wanted? <laughs> um, you know, that's a game I stopped playing. Uh, yeah, good. Thanks. Yeah, so you stop playing asking for things. Is that what you mean? If I have a sense this is what God wants for me and for my path, then I want it. Yeah. Uh, if it's just for me personally, sometimes, sure. If I want a cookie, I'll have a cookie. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> uh, that's okay, too. But uh, more and more as time goes on, I'm, I'm trying to really focus on tuning into what I feel is is how best can I contribute? And I try to focus on that more and more. Yeah, that's a beautiful prayer. How can I contribute today? Yeah. Yeah. And it, it, and it feels great. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very satisfying. Very, very. Um, okay, well, I just want to um, uh, to wrap up. I, I think your book is a wonderful book for all the reasons that we've stated. There's, I, 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 read, I read people's <clears throat> books people are going to be on the show and um i it's i, I enjoy all the books but i i don't know if it's uh i don't know if it's the computer or I, I, it's <laughs> whatever it is my my uh, my attention has a little bit of a deficit <laughs> uh -huh. and i can i read the book but to sit down i won't sit down and read it in one reading and what I love about yours is it's just this perfect kind of book. I, I don't have to sit down and read it one reading. It's just right there. <laughs> this, this, this is my message for today. So that's beautiful. I'm yeah. glad. I'm really happy you enjoyed it. Yeah. And it's also, it's not like something you finish, right? You, you, oh, no. you, you don't you finish go back to it. You go back through it. You're at a different layer. You're at a different place. And I think it's a yeah. really wonderful gift for the world. Um, yeah. So I will attach to the podcast uh, webpage. Uh, your links and and all of that, and also you mentioned your online Tai Chi or not Tai Chi, Sulam Chi, Sulam Chi, yeah, yeah. Uh, training, the online course, yeah, great, yeah, your online course, um, and I'll let you add whatever else you want before we close. Yeah, well, uh, thank you again for inviting me on your podcast. I, I really enjoyed spending time with you, and yeah, I guess don't lose the faith, everybody. Just yeah, don't lose the faith. faith. Keep on moving forward. <laughs> keep moving forward and all hands on deck. <laughs> <laughs> we all have to bring our light to the world. We all have to bring our light. So that's what the light is calling us. So, And I think about that light that shone itself for you when you were an eight-year-old boy or 10-year-old boy. And it's been with you through your whole life. And you just saw it for that first time then. But I can tell that it's been with you through your whole life and still is. Thank you. As as it is for everyone, as yes. it is for everyone. So yeah, this I, I really like the 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 notion of let's shine our lights as bright as we can, and we can light this world up in a beautiful way. We sure can. We sure can. All right. Thank you so much, Levy. It was wonderful, and um, everyone, thank you for being here. And I now close the spiritual forum. <laughs>